Hello, you're about to listen to a radio program provided by the Limestone Church of Christ, located in Kingston, Ontario. Please feel free to check us out on the web at lookingunterjesus.net. Hello, we're glad you're listening to our program today. My name is Tom Rainwater, and William Stewart from Kingston, Ontario is with us again today. Glad you're here, William. Glad to be with you, Tom. Today, we're going to be continuing our study in the Epistle to the Galatians, And we're looking today at Galatians chapter 3, from verse 19 to chapter 4, verse 7. Now, in our study of Galatians, we pointed out the main theme of the book is in chapter 2, verse 16, where Paul points out that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but by faith in Jesus Christ. He says this to the Gentile brethren because they were being tempted to go back and follow the law of Moses, And Paul tells him, you can't be saved by going back to that. That salvation is only through faith in Jesus Christ. The law of Moses being done away in Christ. But then the Jew might ask the question, well, why did God give the law to Moses? What purpose did it serve? And that's the main question of our discussion today. What is the purpose of the law of Moses? Well, Tom, in the first verse that we're looking at in our text, that's the question that Paul asks. What purpose, then, does the law serve? And he gives an answer, which we'll spend a bit of time discussing uh, as we begin our show today. It was added because of transgressions. The law was added in order to reveal to man what sin was. In Romans chapter 7 and uh, in verse 7, The Apostle Paul said, I would not have known sin except through the law, for I would not have known covetousness unless the law had said, you shall not covet. In Exodus chapter 20, the giving of the law of Moses, there are several thou shalt nots. What God was doing was demonstrating to man what sin was and commanding him not to do these things. In Romans the third chapter, again the Apostle Paul writing, expresses the purpose of the law. He draws from several Old Testament scriptures showing the sin that man had committed. And having given those between verses 9 and 18 of Romans chapter 3, he continues on in verse 19 saying, Now we know that whatever the law says, it says to those who are under the law, that every mouth may be stopped and all the world may become guilty before God. Therefore, by the deeds of the law, no flesh will be justified in his sight, for by the law is the knowledge of sin. Again, the law was given in order to give the knowledge of sin, to reveal sin to us and make it clearly known what sin is. That's right, William, and having shown the Israelites what sin was, the content of the law was also to encourage them to restrain from sin. In Psalm 119, verse 133, the psalmist says, Direct my steps by your word, and let no iniquity have dominion over me. So the psalmist says, Your word, which at that time would have been the law of Moses, by your word I'll be directed in how I ought to walk. In Psalm 18, verses 22 and 23, the psalmist there says that all his judgments were before me. And I did not put away his statutes from me, and I kept myself from my iniquity. So the psalmist says, as long as I held the law close to me and followed it, I kept from sinning. In Deuteronomy 5 and verse 1, Moses says, Hear, O Israel, the statutes and judgments which I speak in your hearing today, that you may learn them and be careful to observe them. So indeed, the The law of Moses was a transgression teacher. It taught them what sin was, and it encouraged them to stay out of sin. That's right, Tom. Besides that, it also showed man how frequently and how easily he fell back into sin. When Moses was with the Lord on top of Mount Sinai, the Lord said to Moses, They have turned aside quickly out of the way which I commanded them. They have made themselves a molded calf, speaking about Israel at the base of the mountain and how they had turned to idolatry. In Judges 2 and verse 17, it is written, Yet they would not listen to their judges, but they played the harlot with other gods and bowed down to them. 
They turn quickly from the way in which their fathers walked. In obeying the commandments of the Lord, they did not do so. And so the law taught man that he frequently and easily would fall back into sin. And William, also the law of Moses, showed them that when they did sin, they were separated from God. Because in the law and the prophets it says in Isaiah 59 and verse 2, But your iniquities have separated you from your God, and your sins have hidden his face from you so that he will not hear. So very serious consequences to sin, being separated from God. In Deuteronomy chapter 28 and verse 58, it says, If you do not carefully observe all the words of this law that are written in this book, that you may fear this glorious and awesome name, the Lord your God. So indeed, if they didn't keep the law, they had reason to fear God. They were cut off from Him. That's right, Tom. Even further to that, it taught man that sin demanded atonement, that there was a cost involved to their sin, and that a blood sacrifice would be required. In Leviticus 17 and verse 11, it reads, For the life of the flesh is in the blood, and I have given it to you upon the altar to make atonement for your souls. For it is the blood that makes atonement for your souls. In Hebrews chapter 9 and verse 22, we read, And according to the law, almost all things are purged with blood, and without shedding of blood there is no remission. And therefore the law taught this necessity for a blood sacrifice, for atonement to be made. And so you see how important the law of Moses was in teaching the people about sin and the consequences of sin and the need for an atonement. The law of Moses itself was never intended to be a solution to sin. In Romans 7 verse 10, Paul says, And the commandment, speaking of the law of Moses, which was to bring life, I found to bring death. In Hebrews chapter 10, where it talks about the sacrifices that were done under the law of Moses, it says that with those animal sacrifices, there was a reminder of sins every year, for it is not possible that the blood of bulls and goats could take away sins. So the law of Moses had a job to teach, but not to save. Something else would have to do that. Tom, as we again look at verse 19, he says that it was added because of transgressions till the seed should come, to whom the promise was made. Notice that word till in the text. The the law had a job to do. It was added because of transgression. He gives us a time frame for it. He, He tells us that it was a temporary thing till the seed should come. Now, we dealt last week with the seed in verse 16, that Abraham and his seed received the promises. And he doesn't say seeds as of many, but as of one to your seed who is Christ. And so when the Christ would come, that would signify the end of the law. Notice in Colossians 2 and verse 14, we're told of Christ that he has wiped out the handwriting of requirements that was against us, which was contrary to us. And he has taken it out of the way, having nailed it to the cross. Exactly right, William. That passage in Colossians clearly says that when Christ died on the cross... The law of Moses was no longer in effect. He nailed it to the cross. Its job was completed. And uh, another thing about it that Paul points out in the last part of verse 19 is that, and it was appointed through angels by the hand of a mediator. And he says in verse 20, Now a mediator does not mediate for one only, but God is one. I think the point that Paul is trying to make here is that the law of Moses itself was given to the people through mediators. We know that God gave the law to the Israelites through the direction of angels. Uh, Moses certainly was the one who revealed that law to the people. But when you compare that to the promise to Abraham, the promise to Abraham was given directly to Abraham by God. There was no mediator there whatsoever. And I think Paul is simply showing the superiority of the promise over the law. And so in verse 21, I think Paul raises a question that a Jew might have at this point, that is the law then against the promises of God? 
a Jew understanding what we've looked at so far might think, well, you're saying that the law and the promise are competing against one another, that they're against one another. Well, William, was that the case? Well, Tom, the, the apostle says certainly not. And he goes on to say, for if there had been a law given which could have given life, truly righteousness would have been by the law. The fact is that righteousness could not come by the law because that would require the perfect keeping of the law. And as we've talked about, the very purpose of the law was to reveal transgression, was to clearly identify that for man, was to show him that he ought not transgress, but that he did transgress and that he needed atonement. And so the law was not against the promise. The promise was the solution to what the law showed man. Yeah, that's right. Because if the law of Moses had been designed to save people from their sins, then certainly there would be no need for the promise. So they're not at odds against each other. Actually, the promise complements the law. And in verse 22, it says, But the scripture talking about the scriptures of the law of Moses, but the scripture has confined all under sin. And as we said, the law pointed out to the Jews that they were sinful and under the penalty of sin. And the word confined here in the text means imprisoned. That here the law imprisoned them in their sin. That the promise by faith in Jesus Christ might be given to those who believe. So as the law of Moses imprisoned, the promise by faith set them free from that prison. It's interesting, Tom, how the promise was given by God to Abraham, but the fulfillment didn't take place until about 2,000 years later. Between the giving of the promise and the fulfillment, the law was put in there in order to prepare God's people for the fulfillment of that promise. William, had it not been for the law of Moses, we wouldn't appreciate what Jesus Christ did for us. That's right. We wouldn't have the understanding of what sin is and the cost that sin brings with it. And like you said a while ago, William, the purpose of the law was to bring the Jews to this knowledge that they needed a deliverer. The Jews were ready, waiting for the Messiah to come. They had an anticipation of the Messiah. There were Jews who were waiting in Jerusalem, like Anna and Simeon, who were waiting on the redemption of Israel. They understood the promises about the Messiah. They knew the law itself wasn't sufficient. There had to be someone who would come to save them. And so in verse 24 of our text here in Galatians 3, Paul says, Therefore the law was our tutor to bring us to Christ, that we might be justified by faith. The law had this purpose. Now, it says the law was our tutor. The old King James says schoolmaster. And back in those days, it was common among the Romans for them to have a guide or a custodian for their children. This would be a, a trusted servant who would be employed by the family to have a general oversight over their children, maybe over a child from about six years old to about 16 years old. And this schoolmaster or tutor would escort the children to school. It would be the child's disciplinarian, a guardian against bad influences. And this schoolmaster would be strict. He would help the child till the child reached maturity when the child grew up and would no longer need that discipline and guidance. And Paul is saying that the law of Moses had this very role. It was a stern tutor designed by God to guide the Israelites. That there would be a time, though, in which the tutor would no longer be needed. That's when they were brought to full knowledge about Jesus Christ and how they could be saved through him from their sins. He speaks there in verse 24, Tom, about the law as being the tutor. In verse 23 and 25, he talks about the faith as well. In verse 23, he says, Before faith came, we were kept under guard by the law. The faith there, he's talking about a system of faith. He's not talking about personal faith. Certainly, the Jews had faith in God. But he's speaking about a system of faith that would come. After that new system has come, then they're no longer under the tutor. They're no longer subject to the law. The law would no longer be needed. 
That's right, William. And so, having established the point that the law of Moses is no longer valid and that we're saved in Christ now, he says to the Galatian brethren, verse 26, For you are all sons of God through faith in Jesus Christ. Now, he calls them sons of God. They are children of God. They are in full spiritual fellowship with Him. Not by the law, but through faith in Christ Jesus. And if they were going to maintain that spiritual fellowship with God, they're going to have to maintain their faith in Christ. But in verse 27, he describes the point at which they became children of God. He says, For as many of you as were baptized into Christ have put on Christ. He's not teaching faith only in this context. He's teaching an obedient faith and that he says that as many of you as were baptized into Christ have put on Christ, that you've entered into this relationship with him through baptism, through immersion in water for the forgiveness of sins. That's right, Tom. Here's a simple way to look at verse 26 and 27. There's four questions that the apostle answers in these two verses. First of all, who are you? He says, you are all sons of God. How is it that we're sons of God? He says, through faith. Not through the law, but through faith. Where is it that we are sons of God? In Christ Jesus. And how or when did we become sons through faith in Christ? He says, when you were baptized into Christ, you put on Christ. And so we might summarize it with those four questions that Paul gives us answers to in this text. We are sons of God through faith in Christ, and that happened when we were baptized or immersed into Christ, for then we put on Christ. This phrase that you've put on Christ, the New American Standard here says that for all of you who were baptized into Christ have clothed yourselves with Christ. If I'm going to be in like character to Christ, if I'm going to be in full fellowship with Him, then I'm going to have to be baptized. And Tom, we see Paul talking about being baptized into Christ. The phrase, into Christ, appears twice in Scripture. In this text, where he talks about us being baptized into Christ, and in Romans chapter 6 and verse 3, where also he talks about us being baptized into Christ. That is the only way we can get into Christ. If we've not been baptized into Christ, then that means we're outside of Christ. And that's right, William. And I think as we look at the text, we definitely see that baptism is part of that system of salvation by faith in Christ. In verse 28, he says, There is neither Jew nor Greek, there is neither slave nor free, there is neither male nor female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. So this promise of being saved by obedient faith is for all people. Race or birthright has nothing to do with salvation. Being slave or free, your social standing has nothing to do with your salvation. Or what sex you are, male or female, has nothing to do with your salvation. Your obedience through faith has everything to do with it. And anyone on the planet who obeys the Lord, is one together in Christ Jesus. And Tom, that brings us to the close of this chapter, verse 29. The apostle writes, And if you are Christ, then you are Abraham's seed, and heirs according to the promise. And so he tells us, if we are Christ, if we belong to him, then we're Abraham's seed. That's right. If you follow the example of Abraham through faith, you are his seed and heirs according to that wonderful promise given to Abraham in the book of Genesis. And so he's telling the Galatian brethren they can have confidence in their salvation as long as they continue in faith. Paul continues in chapter 4. He begins another illustration. And here he talks about a child and a servant. And he says in verse 1, Now I say that the heir as long as he is a child, does not differ at all from a slave, though he is master of all. So he brings up this situation where you have a child who one day is going to inherit the estate from his father. He's not at that point yet. He's still a child, and so the estate is not really his. The inheritance is not his yet. Well, 
there's a servant or a slave in the household. And certainly the slave is not in possession of the estate or the inheritance. And so here we have the child being young and the slave, and neither one of them has the inheritance. But the heir, it says in verse 2, is under guardians and stewards until the time appointed by the father. So this is like the schoolmaster or the tutor that we read back in the previous chapter. Here is this child put under this guardianship by these instructors, and it's the father's will that the son be instructed in this way, but only for a certain time. The child's going to grow up. The heir is going to grow up. And when he grows up, then he can acquire the estate. But it's only until a time appointed by his father. In essence, in this illustration, Paul is comparing the heir to the Jews, that they at some point were expected by their father, by God, to receive the inheritance, but only after they've been instructed and tutored by the law of Moses. So God expected them to acquire the estate after they learned the truth. And this would be the truth about their sin, and they needed the Messiah to save them. That's right, Tom, and we continue in verse 3. It says, Even so, we, when we were children, were in bondage under the elements of the world. But when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his Son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those who were under the law, that we might receive the adoption as sons. And he says they were under bondage. But the fullness of time had come. We talked about that back in verse 19, till the seed should come. We talked about that in verse 2, until the time appointed by the Father. And so when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his Son, born of a woman, born under the law. Now, he tells us that he was born under the law. Jesus, born under that law, kept that law perfectly. We've said previous that the law taught man about sin and it revealed how we so easily would fall into sin. Jesus is the one exception. Jesus is the one who kept that law perfectly in order that he might be the sacrifice, the Lamb of God, whereby we might have salvation. He was sent, as verse 5 says, to redeem those who were under the law in order that we might receive the adoption as sons. William, this is a wonderful thing about this, that God provided salvation not only to the Jews who would come to this faith in Christ, but also the Gentiles. The slave in the illustration is the Gentile. And a slave in a household is not going to receive the inheritance unless the slave is adopted as a child. And that's what God has done for the Gentiles, included them in the promise And thus, it doesn't matter whether you're a Jew or Gentile, whether you're an heir or slave, all are under sin, and Christ is the only one that can save you. And thus, when you obey, you become a child, a true child of God. And he says in verse 6, And because you are sons, God has sent forth the Spirit of his Son into your hearts, crying out, Abba, Father. And so he says, And because you are indeed sons of God through faith, and obedience in Christ, you can know in your heart fully that you are truly a son. You can have an attitude of sonship and be like a son. Tom, that phrase that he uses that we cry out, Abba, Father, is a really neat phrase. Abba means father. And so essentially it is father, father. The word Abba comes from the Aramaic, and the Jews would use that in their prayers along with their word for father. But the nature of the word Abba is very simple. If we look at it, Abba is very much like words that young children will use. When a young child first speaks of their father, they'll say Dada, or they'll say Papa, or something of that nature. And in every nationality, there's this simple word which is formed by the mouth of infants to speak about their father a word of security, a word of complete trust. And that may be what this is conveying to us of our relationship to God and the Gentiles specifically who did not have that relationship. Paul is saying you can have that closeness 
the spirit that the Son has. Just an amazing word. Right, it, it would be a term that would be a term of endearment. It would describe family love. When you talk about slaves in a household, they were not permitted to address their masters as Abba. That was a no-no. But in Christ, we're no longer a slave. We're no longer a slave of sin. We are a child. We are a son of God. And he says in verse 7, Therefore you are no longer a slave, but a son. And if a son, then an heir of God through Christ. So since you have the full rights of sonship, you have the full rights to inheritance. Now, at the end of the program, let's summarize what we've learned from the text. Number one, the purpose of Moses' law was to teach man about sin, its consequences, and the need for a blood sacrifice to atone for sin. Number two, Jesus Christ came to be that atonement, to sacrifice himself for our sins, in fulfillment of God's promise to Abraham. Number three, because of what Jesus did on the cross, all people can be saved through faith in him and by being baptized into him. If we do that, then we are sons of God. We're also Abraham's seed and heirs of the promise. We hope you've enjoyed our program today. Have a great day. Jeez.